before we start, let's just pray and ask God's blessing on these wonderful words. Lord, we pray that as we sow the seed and your seed of your word is being sown into our hearts, that we will have that excitement building up within us, knowing that we are more than overcomers, that you've called us, Lord, to not be beggars, but we are princes and princesses. And Father, we want to stand on your word, for your word is true. And when we declare this, Father, we can begin to shout out into the physical world the power of your word, and things will change. Yes. For we believe that you are the initiator of the world, but also the fulfiller of the word. Yes, Father. And we bring you honor, glory, and praise yes. for it. Now, if I were to, uh, to give it a title maybe today, I would say this, a desire to be greater than he that is in the world. Now, that is my desire, uh, that we would be beginning to demonstrate that with, which is within us. Now, Scripture says that when we have the Holy Spirit within us, of course, uh, we are greater than he that's in the world. And for that, we are grateful. So I want to take you through a scripture, especially today, uh, for you to be encouraged by it. So what we need to do is, is to listen to what the word of God is saying to us. Um, it is time for the church to grow more powerful in stature. Do you believe that? Uh, I believe that the church has, has come to a place where we, we look more like beggars than what we uh, should be in terms of acknowledging the power that is actually resident within us. Uh, yeah. You know, I listened to some of the messages that was on the M5, and we make certain declarations. We, we declare that, that uh, God can make the difference in our lives and in the lives of our loved ones. Yeah. But what needs to happen is that the power that is within you and within me that that would begin to rise to the surface. That mm. the church become what God has always intended it to be. Yeah. Yeah. Praise now, the Lord. Let us have a look at scripture in Isaiah 5 and they from uh, verse 13. Isaiah 5 and they from verse 13. It says this. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And I think that's a very powerful scripture. He says, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Now, within the context of the scripture in Isaiah, uh, God was speaking to the nation that has been taken away purely because they, they lost what they had. They were looking away from God, having false gods and, and doing all those things that they should not have done. Uh, so in other words, they lost the knowledge of the word of God. And I want to encourage you. Listen again to what the scripture says. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity. And I wonder whether we as a church have been taken into captivity in many ways. Uh, we've lost the power and how often do we still see the, the, the manifestation of the giftings of the Holy Spirit operating, not just in the church, but even in our own lives? Uh, if we begin to operate in those giftings, the world will be a completely different place uh, altogether. And now he says, because they have no knowledge, it is because we don't always understand who we are in the Lord that we lose out. So I want to encourage you through this portion of scripture. The foundation for this growth of knowledge uh, we find in 1 John 4.4. 4. And I want you to be encouraged by that. This is a, a verse that is very close to my heart uh, and we made mention of it. 1 John 4.4. 4. It is time that the church begin to equip themselves with the word of God so that we might be able to speak out the things that is in scripture. 1 John 4.4 4 says this. God's spirit is in you and is more powerful than the one that is in the world. Now, you might have a different translation uh, to that, but I thought this translation kind of just put it forward uh, very strongly. God's spirit in you, he that is within you, is greater than he that's in the world. 
You get that? So this translation would have that God's spirit is in you and is more powerful than the one that is in the world. It doesn't matter what the enemy wants to tell you. The report of the enemy is under the report of God. God's report supersedes the power of the enemy. And we as, as believers should begin to operate exactly within that framework. Begin to understand who it truly is in Christ. And listen, you can go away to this afternoon and, and just say we, we enjoyed what we heard. And not allow the seed of God's word to fall into our hearts. But I honestly believe that we are finding ourselves in a time frame where the pressures from the spirit of this world is going to get even worse. And if we do not begin to rise up from this pit of allowing things around us to distract us, we will be losing what God wants us to experience. And 1 John 4 says, for God's spirit is in you and is more powerful than the one that is in the world. So how can I experience a deeper and a closer, more intimate relationship with Christ? And I think that's the question that we need to ask. If I were to make a statement and, and I were to say to you, I believe that your heart's desire this afternoon is to see more of God in your life manifested than what you are experiencing at this point in time. And I believe that the answer that I will get from everyone is it is so. This is our heart's desire. I want to be more than what I am at this point in time. Now, I believe that the Spirit of God wants to give us and feed us today with, with those kind of things that we need in order to rise up from where we are. I don't know you, but I'm tired of just accepting where I am. I want to experience that rising up in the spirit where we can take authority over situations and circumstances and we see the authority manifested. You know, very often we pray over things and we kind of have this attitude, if it happens, it happens. If we're really honest about it. But where's that authority of really speaking out in circumstances and situations? And believing that what God says will happen. But how do I get to that place of beginning to speak in the authority and the power of the Holy Spirit? We can know Christ more intimately by only doing one thing. Obeying his commandments. That's the only way that we can be built up. That you and I can be encouraged. And part of the commandments and we can we can mm -hmm. go through the series of of these 10 but that's not what it's all about or let me rephrase that that is what it's all about <laughs> god wants to give us these uh, 10 commandments in it for a particular reason for remember when the pharisees ask him the question what is the imp most important uh, of all the commandments he started off to saying that you need to love God and, and serve him with all your heart. And then he continues to make the statement. He says, an equal to this, in other words, the other leg to this, in parallel with this, love everybody else like you love yourself. And I found that in the first <laughs> instance, we find the first four commandments covered by Jesus when he said that. And in the second verse, the next six covered. So there's certain things that you wouldn't do if you truly loved people around you. You wouldn't take off them. You wouldn't cover them. Uh, you, you would honor your parents. Uh, you would have forgiveness in your heart for people that have done whatever they have or might have against you because you have Christ's heart of forgiveness and you want to manifest in that. So we can now know Christ more intimately by obeying him. And that is the key word, to obey it. And, and I kind of want to just uh, highlight this phrase through the course of this afternoon. In John 14, verse 21, and I would love to use that scripture as our basis. Whatever has gone before, it's just to encourage us that we are where we are because of lack of knowledge. 
we should know that he that's within me is greater than he that's in the world. But here God gives us the secret uh, to experience that obedience and power. <coughs> Excuse me. He says in John 14, 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and reveal myself to him. I don't know you, but uh, I've read through this scripture or, or I've read this particular scripture many a time before. But I believe that God wants to speak to us through this scripture today. He says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my father. And I will love him and reveal myself to him. You see, here yeah, Jesus comes and he speaks to the disciples and he says to them, there's a certain way of experiencing spiritual power. And that way of experiencing it is through obedience to my commandments, because that is the way that I know that you really love me. How often do people use the phrase, especially in the time and times that we live in, uh, to say, I love you, purely because it is four letters string together. They hardly understand the true meaning of that word. And now God comes and, and, and through the scripture, Jesus speaks to us by saying, it is not enough to just like me. It is not enough to just acknowledge me. You need to love me. You know, when it comes to that love, it is something that we need to ask ourselves, how important is he? How much do I honestly love him? Has he become more important than anything else in my life? Because if he hasn't, then we haven't even come to touching the authority and the power that God has intended for us. So this scripture, John 14, 21, then, whoever has my commandment keeps them. So obedience is the evidence that we love Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we can say a lot. You can say so much about it, but unless there's an evidence of it, uh, we can hardly believe that. God wants the, it, it is like a tree that bears fruit. I mean, if it's a fruit tree, it will bear fruit. That's, that's its purpose. That's its calling. It needs to bear fruit. So in other words, when the tree do not bear fruit, you know it's fruitless. And it's the same with a Christian. If a Christian or a person that calls himself a Christian do not bear certain fruit, you can know that they haven't got the compassion and that true love for the Lord. Jesus noted that those who love him would obey his teachings. So that is, in other words, the first, uh, and first fruit that needs to appear. John 15, uh, 14 Verse 15, that we've just read, <coughs> excuse me, John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, you will do as I command. See how important this phrase, these phrases are. We've just read that from uh, chapter 14, verse 21, when Jesus mentioned the love. And now it comes in. In 14, 15, and he says, if you love me, you will do as I command. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to bring us to a place where the world gets to know what a true believer looks like. And the empowerment of a true believer. And it's up to us to commit ourselves to exactly that. The Holy Spirit would come to be in believers that love the Lord. Uh, that's also a promise that Jesus is making in John 14, verse 17, the last portion there. He says, you know him, which is the Holy Spirit, because he lives with you and be, will be with you. 
In other words, now Jesus is not making just one statement. He continues on this phase. He says that if you love me, you will obey me. He says, and when you do, you will have the Holy Spirit within you. It is a guarantee. You see, God is no man that he would lie. When Jesus made a promise, he keeps it. So you and I should expect to see the manifestation of the Holy Spirit working in and through us. And for that, then, we need to, and I'm just going to mention it, the fruit of the Spirit is those nine four parts of the fruit. That should manifest from a child of God that have the Holy Spirit in them. But then we also find the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Those gifts should also be part and parcel of our Christian life. So I want to, to kind of challenge you. Uh, Paul says that we should invite the Holy Spirit to work through us, through those kind of, those giftings. And when we are willing, he will do exactly that for us. You know him because he lives with you and be, will be with you. Our ability to follow the will of God depends on the influence of the Spirit in us. Now, this is a statement that I believe is, is absolutely powerful. You see, if you have the Holy Spirit working in and through your life, there cannot but be a manifestation. Remember now, if you love the Lord, you will obey the commandments. And now Jesus says, once you get to that place, you will have the Holy Spirit within you. And where the Holy Spirit is, there is a manifestation. It cannot be any other way because it's a promise from the word of God. So maybe it is time that we go back to the beginning. And we begin to cultivate this love that we have for the Lord. Say, Lord, show me in terms of the commandments where I fall short, where I don't get to that place where you want me to, to be. And, and I know, and you know, that we aren't able to follow through unless we have the Holy Spirit within us. He says, you know him because he lives with you and will be with you. But this ability, follow the will of God, depends on the influence of the Spirit. Now, listen what the Word of God says in John 16, and there from verse 8. John 16 and verse 8. When he comes, and this is the Holy Spirit, John 16, verse 8. When he comes, he will show that the world is wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. So in other words, if I were to just lay out the verse, because the following verse actually expand on it. But this verse now, when he comes, he will show, in other words, when he lives in you, he will show that the world is wrong about sin. You know what the world nowadays says. Everything kind of goes. Hardly anything is wrong anymore because they want to rewrite the word of God. They want to make it to fit into where we are in our lives uh, today, where the culture is. The culture should follow the word of God, not the other way around. And I think that's the powerful message that we have. Now he says the Holy Spirit will get through that place within your heart that he shows you what sin really is. You know, when you get that check in the spirit, something just seems not to be kosher. And I, I kind of <laughs> like the word kosher because it says so much to us. It is not kosher. So the Holy Spirit shows us what is right and what is wrong. But then he goes on to say, and about righteousness. So we not just show us the wrong. He also guides us into be right aligned with God. But you cannot have it unless you allow the Holy Spirit to work in and through you. And then he speaks about judgment. Now this judgment is the judgment of the enemy. He has already been in the court, declared to be uh, guilty. The judgment has already been spoken out against him. And he already knows his end. 
So the Holy Spirit are telling us that we are more than overcomers against the enemy. Sin is sin. God shows us through his Holy Spirit how to get out from any situation, any temptation. And the enemy is powerless when you have the Holy Spirit within you. He cannot overcome you. And I want to encourage you with this portion of scripture because it is empowering. If we really believe what the Bible says. So obedience is the evidence that we love Jesus Christ. But the second point I want to highlight there, to obey Christ's commandments, we first must have them. Uh, to me, that was interesting when, when I read the scripture and the portions just started to, to be highlighted from the word of God. Remember now what John 14, 21 says. He says, whoever has my commandments. That's a very important phrase because that opens the door. And now he comes in and he says this to us. To obey Christ's commandments, we first must have them. Some know the word, but they do not keep it. It is like some people just read the scriptures. They understand it. They've got all the knowledge. But there's no application. And Jesus knew it even then. Because in Isaiah 5.20, he uses this phrase. He says, you are headed for trouble. I use a different translation again so that you might be encouraged by that. Verse 20 and 21. Isaiah 5, 20 and 21. You are headed for trouble. You say wrong is right. Darkness is light and bitter is sweet. Isn't that exactly what's happening today? Yes. You know, when, when you believe something is right, it's like the world thinks that you are foolish. How can you think it? Where's your heart of compassion towards people that are caught up in certain circumstances and situations? It is, it is not about passion, though. It is about what's right or wrong. And if, if we come to that place where the Holy Spirit begins to work through us, we won't be judging people. We will just lift up the mirror of the word of God. And then he goes on in verse 21 by saying, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. So there's a warning there. God says, be, be careful that you don't set yourself up higher than what God is. If, if you say something that God says is wrong and you try to make it right by your interpretation, you are actually saying God doesn't know what he's talking about. You get what I'm trying to say? It is so sad that we find so many groupings that work from the word of God and still there's so many interpretations. The word should be the plumb line. That should be what we use. If it's not in the Bible, it's not something we teach. If it is in the Bible, obey it. You get where the lines are. Now, to obey Christ's commandments, we must also apply it. So it's not just a question of uh, knowing about it. Uh, but you can't apply anything anyway if you haven't got it yet. Uh, you know, it's like, you can get in the shower a hundred times, but unless you use the soap, uh, you won't come clean. You need the soap. So having the soap just there on, on the shelf wouldn't help too much. You need to take it off the shelf and begin to apply it in order to be clean. Listen to what the word of God says in Mark 7 and there verse 6. Mark 7, verse 6. He says, Yeshua answered them. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. He's on about the, the Pharisees. As it is written, and now he show, points back to the word of God. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. And I think this is what the world very often say to us. 
You know, we call ourselves believers, but we're kind of powerless. And if ever there was a time that the church need to rise up for the challenge, it certainly is now. And it cannot begin by with someone else. It's got to start with, with us individually. I need to be saying to the Lord, Lord, I want to rise up from where I am. Guide me through your Holy Spirit that I might be lifted up. Listen again, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. So I pray that God will give us the courage, the strength, that we will not be just hearers of his word, but that we will become doers of his word. See, the thing is, good works cannot produce salvation. So even if you are, uh, as we normally would have had, coming to church on a weekly basis and maybe more than once and you do all the nice things to people you know you you sacrifice your own life you you even tithe and bring offerings and and sow into different other areas you can do all those things but be unsaved salvation is what it's all about then you come into obedience titus 3 verse 5 makes this statement he saved us titus 3 verse 5 he saved us because of his mercy and not because of any good things that we have done we should get to that understanding it is his mercy for us to be in his presence God washed us by the power of the Holy Spirit and he gave us new birth and a fresh beginning. And I believe God wants to say to us as a fellowship and as a people, as we listen to his word, I want to bring you into a new phase of understanding, a new birth, a new beginning. Uh, you know, every day can be a new beginning. But the coming of the Lord is near and and we need to put more emphasis into saying, Lord, I want to show off your glory to the world. I want to have the fullness of your Holy Spirit within me so that I might be more than what I could ever think or dream I could be. Not in my own power, but through what you are doing for me. See, the keys to keeping the commandments, uh, just quickly for, uh, he says, responding to the unchanging life of Christ will help us to keep the commandments. In other words, if, if I come to that place of saying, Lord, I know that you love me. I love you back, Lord. I return that love. That love will make for me to keep to his commandments. Realizing the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us will help us to keep the commandments. If you make sure that you know that the Holy Spirit is in you and you have all the ability. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit that, that created all that power is there. It's the same Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead that is within you and I. Now, if he could do it for Jesus out of the dead, uh, we are still alive. Uh, and maybe we just need to be woken up, so to speak, to say, Lord, here I am. I want to be used by you. Relying on the Holy Spirit for guidance will help us to, to fulfill God's in obedience the commandments so in other words when i get to that place of saying lord i don't want to do it my way i, I don't want to do it frank sinatra way i want to do it in your way lord i want to be in a place where where you are being glorified so show me where i need to go but also remembering that jesus has given us the example of what it is uh, to follow through on the commandments now, I want to say this to you. A lot of people use this as a, as a kind of a backdoor to say, yes, but Jesus was Jesus. He was part of the Godhead. Uh, now, that's a wrong perception. Because he could never have done what he had done if he had not become fully man. That's what the Bible says. So there's no temptation that we are experiencing that he did not experience and that he did not overcome. How did he overcome it? I want to remind you, after he was baptized, the dove came over him, presence of the Holy Spirit came, and, and the declaration from Father 
God the Father was, this is my beloved son. Now you know that through the blood of the Lamb, that has been spoken out over you and I. When he said, listen, you are my beloved son, my daughter. I am empowering you with the Holy Spirit so that you might overcome whatever come your way. Don't live the life of a loser while you are more than an overcomer. I want you to get a hold of this. Don't give in to the report of the enemy either. Believe that God can make a way. But how do we do that? Get to love him more than ever before. Get back into that relationship of saying, Lord, I cannot uh, keep on doing whatever I'm doing unless I have my hand in your hand. And we want to close with this. What is the result of loving Jesus? What is the results of loving Jesus? He says in that scripture that we have read in, in John 14, 21, he says, he it is, only he will be perceptive to the Father's love, love. Receptive to the Father's love. Who will be the one to receive God's love? Now I want to just qualify this quickly. Uh, John 3.16 says that John, uh, God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So in other words, God has a universal love for everybody. So much so that he sent his son. So that none should perish, but all come to eternal life. But in this portion of scripture, in John 14, 21, let me read that to you. He says, and the one who loves me will be loved by my father. This is a different level of love altogether. This is the love when, when our father comes to you. And whenever you are in a situation that, that is dire, he would come and, and, and just allow you to hear his heartbeat. It is a higher dimension of his presence and his love, if ever there could be. So I don't want to make this a doctrine, but I want you to understand that the moment I love Jesus, it is like a bottle taking the top off. And it allows God that has all his love around me to all of a sudden begin to pour his love inside of me. That makes a huge difference. Because now that power can begin to work from within, not just from outside. This expression implies some further and greater manifestation of Father's love. This is why he says, and the one who loves me will be loved by my father. It's a promise Jesus makes. So why would he go back on his word? But it all starts with, if you love me and obey my commandments, then God the Father will come and pour into you as a container and you will begin to receive what he has for you. This verse also implies that Jesus re will reveal his nature and his goodness to us. In other words, the moment, man, I'm so excited when I read this actually. Because he says, if you love me, you'll follow my commandments. And the moment you come into obedience, something happens. God now begins to pour into that container. He begins to pour in his love. And the moment Jesus notices the love of God that begins to fill you in, he makes a promise. Get this promise now. He says, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. People ask, why is it that Jesus is not revealing him in his fullness to me? Well, here's the reason. You've got to start right at the beginning to say, Lord, I love you. I will follow your commandments. And the moment you come into obedience, God undo the cap. And he begins to pour in his love, which, which is a love that just attracts the presence of Jesus. In other words, the Holy Spirit as well as God is. And now all of a sudden that manifestation begins to happen. It is like boiling water within you. You know, when you put milk in, in a container, and you put it in on the stove or into the microwave and you keep it uh, just a little bit too long in there, you know what happens. It seems to amplify. It seems to just wash over everything 
close to it. It, it, it doubles up. And this is what the presence of God wants to do for, for us. The moment we love him, we do his commandments, God the Father fills us in, and Jesus now comes and he fills, <coughs> begin to manifest him. Listen to what he says. I will love him, that return of love at a different level, and reveal myself to him. This word reveal is actually a very important word in this context because it means to show, show off, to, to come and show himself, to come and appear. And this word appear there uh, boils down to even visible. Wouldn't that be fantastic? When we begin to see into the spiritual, remember when the prophet and, and, and uh, uh, his, his worker with him saw all those chariots all around the city. Remember the prophet said to him, uh, to God, open his eyes that he might see. The moment you begin to come in obedience to God, God begins to open your eyes for his wonder working power. All he's waiting for you is to undo, uncap yourself so that he can pour in his love. And the uncapping takes place because of obedience, obedience to the Lord. And I want to close with, with this phrase, to stand strong and overcome the ambush of the enemy. Start with sincerely loving the Lord. If you want to overcome the ambush of the enemy, begin by sincerely loving Jesus. So here's the question. How much do you love him? And if you do, you will follow his commandments. I believe, humanly spoken, I believe that, that God cannot wait for us to come into the fullness of his plan for us. You know, that release, that, that uh, letting go, so that we actually become part of him in the true sense of the word.